Hello, everybody. Okay, a um, couple more people I'm guessing will join us in the next few minutes, so we won't get to the slides for just a little bit. A couple of announcements that uh, obviously should be of importance to all of you about uh, upcoming deadlines and uh, extra credit, actually a new uh, couple of extra credit options. Um, so let me do the speaker view here, okay? And I have, you know, uh, a helpful handout to show you, or not handout, hold up, <laughs> there we go, as in not, not the kind of holdup that occurs in a <clears throat> crime movie, but this kind of holdup. Um, you have two weeks, it's, it's not, you know, uh, that far away to, uh, you know, choose. If you haven't already, in other words, you should choose a topic as soon as possible for your second paper, because it's a quarter of your grade. And then, um, of course, you um, need to do the research and the same exact requirements are required or are going to apply to this second paper. So now I obviously did some hand printing minor alterations so I could use this again for uh, my other classes. <clears throat> but this obviously is how you should write the label for your PDF file. And it does need to be a PDF file. Uh, and that is with the attachment I sent. Um, I haven't yet sent, sorry, I haven't yet for this class because it's two weeks from now. So I, I usually about five days, a few days before it's due, I uh, send the cover sheet and it'll say short paper number two. So there'll be no confusion about which one is being graded. So you of course label them um, art, 2.1 short paper number two underline last name comma first name and uh then you send them to mark w at aol i think most people have done that i understand if if they get sent to the outlook it'll just take me longer to download them they'll still count i mean it is the campus website so of course i would accept them but it's much better for your sake if you want them logged in or confirmed and if you need me to confirm please ask me that because I, I and obviously dozens of papers at once you know but certainly from uh, my largest class it, i get that many i don't always just you know respond to every single uh submitted paper unless someone asks me to and i'm happy to at any point then okay and say yes i've received them uh and then obviously i have to download them open them make them sure they're make sure they're openable and that there's nothing missing. Sometimes people submit papers without an illustration, right? Uh, but that hopefully won't happen for anyone in this class. And then they have to be, you know, dispersed between me. I do a great big portion of them. And then if my readers, or one of my readers usually grades the others, and then I double check that reader's work always before I uh, send you the grades. But usually that's about a two week. Uh, lag time before I can return you your grades to you. For those who turn their papers in on time and correctly, meaning with all that information on the, you know, uh, line. Now, if you have a different name, this is a big thing. It's caused some problems with a handful of people in each class this semester and every semester. I understand people often prefer to go by a different name than whatever happened when they enrolled. I don't know why, but if somehow they they didn't use a middle name or a hyphenated second half of a last name or if they used a nickname and they do or the other way around they do that when they send me the um, uh, files pdf files for all their assignments uh, i might have trouble figuring out who it is so try to please to make sure when you label any assignment that would be left there's only two left although i still have a couple people that haven't turned their first paper but i did see a couple that were turned in and i'll get to that in a minute uh first papers uh, which are perfectly acceptable you know, I don't have a cutoff, <clears throat> just 10 points off for being late. By the way, as far as your, your remaining assignments are this one paper, and of course the final, um, I definitely need to have you, if at all possible, remember exactly how you were enrolled. So your name on that um, label for the PDF file, when I get it, it matches what's on my roster, otherwise it causes confusion which can be sorted out but it takes time and delays the grading and you're getting the grade back okay as far as a couple people i did notice I, it's been a pretty busy day I, I i had to go out of town yesterday didn't get back to kind of late 
then today I've already taught a whole class and had a brief like half hour window between the two. Uh, so I haven't had time to uh, open all the emails that are related to extra credit. That's the other two things I'll talk about or, or questions about your second paper. Um, and of course, I think everyone knows the requirements are the same. I just said that, of course, but I mean, if you weren't sure, that's in the five requirements for your short papers that I've already sent to everybody before, of course, the first paper was due. Okay, uh, but extra credit options um, are, you know, really a good way to go. I mean, even if you're earning an A or, you know, you're not quite close to what you hope to get, uh, you can't, it can't hurt to have a cushion or a margin for error, whatever you want to call that. Um, of a few tens of points. Uh, everyone has the same opportunity. All the same uh, options are available to everybody and you can choose what combination. I do prefer you not to do more than 20 points in any one category. That, that's a reasonable thing. So you've, you vary it a little. The 60 points is more than a whole letter grade that you can improve your grades by. Okay, let me let in Elijah. Welcome. Uh, you didn't miss anything. We were just talking about the paper. I've already covered it, so I won't repeat all that. That is due two weeks from tonight, and the same requirements are exactly applied. But as far as extra credit, I have a couple new options to mention that I don't think I've mentioned before. Uh, one of them, I may have mentioned it, but it wasn't live and operable. I guess that's a word, uh, is the piece I did for Marin Magazine. It's in this November, the cover there. It's a monthly magazine, right? Both online and who's going to go buy a hard copy probably nobody but the online version is easy to find on their website it's this month and it's about chief marin well it's the topic we're covering tonight so it's very relevant to mention that that's worth five points unless you happen to want to as one of your fellow students did write a nice short essay of about two pages about what you thought not about the article itself so much is about the topic about it. maybe some of you know more about uh, Miwok culture or other early uh, Northern California indigenous cultures, which was what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, maybe, maybe you know enough to write something about them, or you have your own, you know, connections directly. Um, you don't have to get fancy, but if you choose to write about two pages, is reasonable, I think, with uh, the link for the article, you get ten points. That is also the same standard for the movies. And I am going to do this now. I had never done this before. I've had two students ask me in different classes, not this one actually, but the other two I teach. Can you give us a list of what you think are the five best films about the lives of artists? Oh yeah, I'm happy to do that. So if you, you know, want to, you can either write these down or replay this when it's on YouTube on Friday after 8 p.m. Uh, you can choose any movie you want about any artist you want, as long as it's at least an hour and then write two pages. That's the key about what you learned about that artist and their artwork from that. It can be a documentary, a part of a series, even if it's on, you know, some of the series uh, BBC does on artists, they're wonderful. At least an hour though, you know, so it's not like 20 minutes and two pages about your, uh, you know, impressions, not of it, you know, in terms of its artistic style as a work of art itself, but the information you learned about that artist. So here we go. These, I think, qualify both as artistic works in within the uh, medium of film, though we don't cover film in this class. I've taught film, by the way. I love teaching it at UC Berkeley Extension and Berkeley City College for years. Um, <clears throat> film history. Okay, so... Um, I absolutely cannot think of another film that is better or even very many equally uh, well done about the life of any artist to my favorite personal favorite of all movies about artists. It's called Lust for Life. I imagine a few of you have heard of it. It won several Academy Awards. Is it well deserved? It's about Van Gogh and it takes from about the time he started trying to sketch and just teach himself how to draw all the way through the end of his life. And it definitely, you know, I said to the other class, I said this to uh, other Zoom class, I hate cliches, I know we all do, but it does tug at your heartstrings or whatever phrase you want to use. It's an emotional roller coaster because his life was, as you, I think everybody knows that, he had a hard life. <laughs> And what he produces, some of the most beautiful images in the history of the human race. Nobody would argue with that. 
So this movie has his paintings in them and it shows him creating them. And guess who plays Van Gogh? Kirk Douglas, you might, some of you know enough about that. What? Didn't he play Spartacus running around in a loincloth and greased up? Yeah, what? Those two roles are so dire. Yes, that's the range. Of, he was one of the great actors of Hollywood. 50 plus years. No, more than that. 60 years. Yeah, he died at 104 or something just recently. Um, in any case, he deserved the Academy Award. He was nominated for Best Actor. He didn't get it. But Anthony Quinn, Mexican as an immigrant, Mexican-American citizen and uh, from Mexico, beautiful job as Gauguin. His, his quote, friend slash nemesis. I'm not going to give it away, but the scene where the two of them get into an argument about what is art and what's a good painting and what isn't is a brilliant scene. None of that is documented uh, in terms of the two of them talking or arguing, several scenes in which uh, they show that relationship. That is Van Gogh and Gauguin lived together in an apartment, some of you know this, uh, which was paid for by Go Van Gogh's brother. Van Gogh's brother wanted to have his, you know, big brother, he was the younger of the two, uh, not be so lonely down there in southern France while he was painting. So he set up, a, and unfortunately it was a bad decision. Gauguin was a nasty person, nasty. And you'll see that, and, and there's no debating that. It's well documented. In any case, there are so many powerful scenes in that movie, but the main thing that's so good about, besides the music and cinematography, that those won Academy Awards, as did Anthony Quinn for supporting actor, and I think director or screenplay. It's based on the Pulitzer Prize winning novel of the same title, which was based on all the letters between Van Gogh and his brother. Well, from him, that is Van Gogh, to his brother, every day almost of his uh, later life while he was painting. He wrote to his brother about what he was painting, why he chose that subject, what the meaning of his painting. So we don't have to guess. And in the movie, you see those paintings because the museums that they're in gave permission. 1956, first, one of the first movies about really well done movie, but about two hours, it, it'll go by quickly if you find two hours and you want to watch it and then write two pages of what you thought of it, um, what you learned from it. Okay, the, uh, a close second would be Moulin Rouge. That's the French name of the nightclub that some of you know, Toulouse-Lautrec uh, painted so many times, where the can-can was invented, but it's much more than that. However, there's another version of it. Don't waste your time on the, uh, I like Kirsten Dunst, but it's not her fault. But that movie, that remake in the early aughts, nothing about it is accurate. <laughs> this one is called Moulin Rouge and it's 1954 and Jose Ferrer, you don't know who he is, most of you, I'm sure, but you will be impressed when you, if you watch it. He walked on his knees for months, maybe a whole year, portraying Toulouse Lautrec because Lautrec was about four and a half feet tall, right? And Jose Ferrer is like six something. I know won, that guy. He won the Academy Award and he deserved it for, for Best Actor. He played that. Cyrano de Bergerac, didn't he? Yeah, that's true. He, he was a stal stalwart actor, a very, very popular and successful. But I think this is his most intense role. Sounds like you may. If you haven't seen that one, you might want to do that. Yeah, here we go. Devin, welcome. We're just uh, doing a roundup before we get to the first slides. I can tell you right now, we're going to end extra early tonight. I'm sure no one will object. But there could be material on... Uh, the Miwok and Pomo slides I'm going to show you uh, could be on the uh, final, either as ID uh, or possibly essay, of course, or even as extra credit. Okay, but we'll get to those in, in just a couple more minutes or five minutes, maybe. Let me then again summarize. I was giving a list right of the five, what I consider the five best movies about the life of an artist that you can get extra credit for watching and writing a two page summary of if you just joined us. Okay, so the second one again was uh, Moulin Rouge, the 1954 version, not the one with John Leguizamo. Now, someone was playing games. It's called Name Freakism. I don't know if you know what that's a game that the media used to play. Yeah, how how strange a coincidence is it that he played a guy whose legs were half the length of a normal? Yeah. He did fine. I like John Leguizamo. He's a good actor, but the plot, the dialogue, nothing. It's, it's all made up. Whereas the one called Moulin Rouge was again based on a biography that won all kinds of awards that was the basis for the film, the 1954 uh, version. Okay, and then this one would be way up there, maybe almost tied, or at least a close third, and that would be Frida. Salma Hayek produced that with every studio in Hollywood saying, who wants to see a movie about a crippled commie Mexican woman? 
That literally is what she was told in a couple of these studios in the late 90s. She worked for years to get someone to fund it. If you haven't seen it, that is a very powerful movie. And she plays as well as anyone could possibly do the title character. Uh, and then Alfred Molina, another great actor, a mixed Italian and, and British actor, plays uh, her husband, Diego Rivera. And it's filmed on location and all of her paintings are in it, plus some of Diego Rivera's murals. They had a stormy marriage, you may know this. In fact, they divorced twice and got remarried both times. Uh, it's an accurate, that's a very accurate portrayal of her life. So it's just called freedom. Oh, we, we gotta let, yeah. Hi, welcome. We were just talking about what the five best films, uh, my, or some of them, they just say some of the five. I have a question about the films. Yes, Rob? How many How many can you do? Because I really like film. I can see Well, I think videos. two, I did say, did I? Yeah, but I'll repeat it. Two within the same category, you know, 20 points okay. would make sense. I'm trying to get you to diversify your experience with art. And see, to Got me, it. extra credit is an opportunity, not some kind of a, oh, gee, now I have to do extra credit because I didn't get as good grade as I want. That's not how I see it. And that's not how I saw it when I was a student at Berkeley. And uh, actually, I got, I think I told you guys, I got a C plus my first art history class. For whatever reasons, it doesn't matter. But I wasn't given this opportunity. And ever since I started teaching here, my favorite other art history teachers, including Sarah Gill, my mentor, who hired me because she had taken some of my other classes down here in the East Bay from the adult evening programs. She decided that extra credit was a very wise thing in an art class, especially. So now you've got all these options. So let's finish that list and get to the first slide for tonight. Okay, uh, so the third film, um, well, I mean, fourth, sorry, I already listed the first three. I, I, would, I would have to say it would probably be one of the ones uh, that you probably haven't heard of, um, so let me just give it a second thought here because there's so many good ones. Um, okay. Oh, Picasso. Yeah, there we go. Surviving Picasso. Well, that, that's definitely in the top tier. Um, you've probably never heard of it. It's, it's by uh, a director who interviewed and based the book, I'm uh, sorry, the movie, sorry, on the book written as a memoir by the daughter of the woman it's about. Picasso treated women just awfully. I mean, I don't know any other word for it. In fact, here's another extra credit option just occurred to me. I write for a website, a lifestyle website, travel history, uh, culture website called Wild Keld. It's, it's done moderately well. It's just different information. There's nothing commercial on it. Okay. Uh, the point is that if you just wanted to download one of the articles, it doesn't matter which one, but if it happened to be you wanted to see something about how Picasso treated his women, it was based on an exhibit in San Francisco. Some of you may have seen it about eight years ago. It was just called Picasso's Women. So I wrote a piece for that website. The website is Wild Kelt, just like it sounds one word, Wild Kelt, as in that's my friend's nickname for her website, dot com. And that would be, um, you know, under the, you know, right, the link would be easy to find if you just plug in, you know, a search thing. Uh, it's, I, I think I just kept the title the same as the exhibit about how Picasso treated the women he painted. But this is a woman who got away with it. And her name was Paloma. Oh, no, that's his daughter. Forget the, the, her mother's name. But she walked away from, she left him. He left every other woman that he was ever involved with. Uh, and he usually then came back for emotional game playing abuse is the only word for it. It's, you, you know what I mean, if you ever if read a biography of him or or articles about how he treated the women he painted. But she left with her head held high and he begged her to come back and she said, forget it. <laughs> I, I know I made a mistake even uh, getting married to you. So that's what's called, that movie is called Surviving Picasso. Um, so does that, that's four, I'm trying to remember the fifth one. That's, it's escaping me at the moment. Um, that's probably enough for now. It may come to me before the end of the evening. And if it does at the end, I always stop, as you know, and take questions that relate to what we covered or to extra credit. In this case, the two topics, extra credit options between now and the finals, uh, final week. I accept extra credit up until the last day of finals week, but not after that, because it takes a long time to add all the grades from the tests as well as uh, you know, extra credit and, and calculate each person's grade. I've never missed a deadline yet of submitting student grades. So you have the opportunity to see them in your inbox, right? Your student portal 
your cubby uh, on time, which is the first week of January. So you can count on those uh, being turned in on time. All right. Uh, and then um, the only other questions would be perhaps you know, details about, I already covered pretty much about how to submit your uh, second paper, which is due two weeks from tonight. Okay, so let's get started. And if I think of the fifth movie, it'll probably come to me before we finish up tonight. I'll, I'll add that to that list because I, I said five and I'll try to do that. There's more than that that I've seen that I like, but let's, let's now get started with um, screen share. Here we go. Tonight's topic, which is, let's get rid of this here. Okay. Uh, as you might be able to see, the um, topic is a new one. I just created it because I wrote that, uh, did, did the research on that article over this summer. Um, and uh, this is um, the overall theme for tonight is art of pre-European Bay Area cultures. Well, we're in the North, well, I'm in Berkeley, but I'm in Ohlone territory, but that's not part of the region that you got. Almost none of you live in this area, I don't think, right? Maybe I live in Berkeley or <laughs> Oakland. Anyway, that, that subject has been well covered by books, documentaries, uh, historic uh, museum exhibits, but there hasn't been as much on the North Bay tribes or cultures. So that's what our focus is. The two cultures, indigenous cultures that occupied what we most people would agree is the North Bay. That means Marin, Sonoma, Napa, and Monterey counties. That's the area I'm talking about. What today uh, geographically uh, correspond to those counties. Uh, we're in the southern half of that area, meaning Marin and, and most of Sonoma County, was the coastal Miwok, and that's M-I-W-O-K, coastal Miwok culture. Okay, and then the Pomo occupied more of the northern area from the northern part of uh, Sonoma County all the way up through Mendocino and over to uh, Clear Lake, I believe it was. So those are the two cultures we're gonna concentrate on. All right, so we have only two must know slides. So I'm giving you a break in a way because I know this is either new information or, or not as easy to you know, know how to write about. Uh, but when we get to the two must knows, I will say that you see them on the list but that'll be in a few minutes. First, some context. Okay, so I gave you just geographic range, it's called range or regions that these cultures occupied for well over 6,000 years. Uh, the evidence is of course archeological now about how far back those cultures, uh, indigenous cultures occupied those two parts of the North Bay, the Miwok in the Southern half and the Pomo, P-O-M-O uh, culture in the Northern half at least 6,000 years. That's, far, that's as far back as before the earliest Egyptian artifacts that we covered earlier this semester. And of course, they were very close to the land in every sense of the word. I just want to admire. Yes, pardon? I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, was that just somebody make a side comment? That might be a question. Anyway, so what we're looking at is a culture that had its roots here so far back that when they started, there wasn't much. There was only a handful of urban centers in the uh, uh, Eastern Hemisphere, uh, where Turkey is now. And some of the very, very earliest cities in the Middle East were just getting started then. Egypt wasn't yet a kingdom, uh, you know, which became, of course, one of the world's first and greatest of all urban civilizations in the ancient world. We've covered that. So at this point, um, I can't help it. I'm going to tell you a joke. A few of you may want to check. Moms Mabley, she was an African-American woman who was the first African-American stand-up comedian. And she used to talk about history. And of course, she talked about social justice. But she did everything with her own unique sense of humor. She was one of my family's favorite comedians. I think my dad took me to see her when I was a kid. It's so long, I can't remember. In Chicago, where we grew up. In any case, she had, she had a story about her first husband, she lived to be, I think, close to 100 herself. So she'd start out with this little line, which is relevant to what we're going to be looking at. Uh, she, my husband would start talking about his childhood and he'd say, honey, when we were young, we lived in the country. And I would interrupt him and say, honey, when you were young, everybody lived in the country. Well, that's what we're talking about here. This is a culture where at the time it started, 
uh, everything was practically a rural civilization that of course was sometimes nomadic. We know that, so we're not looking at nomadic cultures now. These, the Miwok and the Pomo had villages, permanent inhabited villages. Some of them were only in the low, you know, a few hundred, but there was a couple that were, oh, thousands, five to 10,000. That's a good sized community in the ancient world, anywhere in, on the planet. And the evidence of those villages is still uh, uh, visible in uh, one place. And we're gonna talk about that one of the two must know slides. Okay, what we're looking at now are the next several slides are exhibits in the um, Museum of the American Indian in Novato. I don't know if you, there's another extra credit option. However, they may be closed still because of the pandemic. They were over the summer. But but if you check their website or you know that you could easily just Google them and get you even get a recorded message on their phone, they update it at least once a week as to whether they will be open. It's usually weekends when they when they are. Uh, even if you can't go inside, you can get extra credit if you uh, want to go there. It's it's in uh, uh, on Novato Boulevard. Like anyway, you can find the address easily enough, or in the article if you want to do that. I wrote from Marin Magazine. Um, then you can download it and forward me the link as well as take the information. If you choose, you can go to this site because outside the museum are several other exhibits on the grounds, which would qualify for a museum visit for 10 points right there. Okay, so yeah. this is uh, part of the exhibits are, all of the exhibits were donated by indigenous people with rare exceptions. A few were by artists from Marin that weren't themselves indigenous and those are noted. But th this was something that was made by um, I believe it's a grade school grade school yeah, grade school there we go grade school age or maybe middle school uh, children some of these exhibits but they were learning about their own culture we're talking about Miwok people and so this is a tule canoe tule right which is a material they used to build some of their homes we're going to see some of that and their canoes were some of the most well what can we say efficient and uh, rapid transportation ever in the Bay Area, even long after the Spanish invaded, but you know, occupied, conquered the area and set up their missions. They relied on the, the uh, Miwok to guide them around the Bay and through rivers and between different lakes because these boats were light enough, they could be carried on the backs of the Indians if they needed to be, you know, obviously it took more than one, but they were very fast and the Miwok were ex excellent navigators because they understood the currents, which the Spanish never seemed to understand, at least from what I've read, until they might've learned from one of their Miwok guides. guides. So the Miwok Indians were, were, of course, not given much choice. Many of them were required, forced is the right word really, to live on the mission grounds uh, but some of them, like Chief Marin, we're going to talk, let's go to the next slide here. Uh, Chief Marin, who, for whom Marin County was named, and that isn't his real name, as I point out at the start of my article. His real name was Huikmus, just like it sounds, and I spelled it out phonetically in my article, Huikmus. But he was given that name by the Spanish missionaries. He was actually given some authority, a position of authority, because they, they, they did respect him enough to know that he knew more than they ever would about you know, the environment about uh, planning seasons in the area, about currents, about navigating in those Thule canoes on all the waterways of the bear. So he actually led, he led several expeditions of Spanish explorers north of uh, Sonoma, all the way up into wherever Chico is and back. All of this is mentioned in an article I did, or you could find it in other articles, I'm sure, uh, probably just general Wikipedia sites uh, or, or uh, citations. Okay, so these are some of the decoys they used for hunting. So they did hunt, they farmed, and they gathered. So they weren't only a one-dimensional, you know, uh, food source for their culture. <clears throat> they did all, all of those, but they mostly did uh, the uh, gathering, uh, fishing. What they live on most was fishing and the different kinds of natural grains that could be produced from plants that grow or that they could cultivate. Uh, in the climate we have. So these are some of their, of course, this would be lures for ducks, and then they, of course, would have had something for, for fishing as well. These are all in different uh, parts of the museum. Actually, this is a better image of what you, you were just looking at. <clears throat> so these Thule canal, uh, canoes, sorry, these Thule canoes uh, were about the size, you can tell, even though that's, you know, obviously somebody's more, much more modern 
doll of, of a Miwok Indian riding in his own canoe. But you get an idea of the scale from it. So I'm sure that's why the, the uh, museum exhibits this with that uh, model. Okay. Now they, they ground these grains and as I say, some of them, they, they you know, the hunter gatherer right, culture we know about goes back tens of thousands of years to the very earliest humanoid, right? Uh, inhabitants of every continent really. Um, but here they develop their own agriculture as well as cutting and gathering all, all three. And so when they did either plant something or gathered something that needed to be made into something like bread in essence, right? Or other kinds of, uh, meal, right? As in meals that they could eat, uh, they, they would use these kind of mortars and pestles that are, well, probably several hundred years old, almost certainly. And then they had tools that were made out of bones, animal bones, as you can see from this uh, slide. Uh, all kinds of, you know, things for fishing, for hunting, uh, for, for farming and making things, including clothing, of course, obviously. Uh, and and some of their their um, homes, which you're going to see uh, the Musnos, one of the two Musnos coming up, is is a typical uh, version of, though a reproduction, an accurate reproduction of one of the two types of housing they had, and both can be seen on the grounds of the Museum of the American Indian in Nevada and one other place. I'll tell you when we get to that those slides. Okay, as you can see, they use different parts of different animals, including the skins, of course. Uh, as well as the bones. But this was interesting. In the Museum of the American Indian, it's a two-story building and upstairs are two things that are very different than the, the Miwok exhibits downstairs. For those of you who may be able to actually go to this museum or even just want to do some research for uh, you know extra credit. They have a collection of dolls made by indigenous people. One actually a display case was made by a, a white woman from her end, but, but they were accurately done. Of, of most of the major Western US indigenous cultures, including the Pueblo, the Navajo, and of course the Miwok, uh, the Pomo, and some of the other Indians. This though is from the South, well, those would be Pueblos, is Southwest, well, in that vein. The, these are some of the oldest objects and any museum in the Bay Area, these are about a thousand years old. And this is a huge, I don't know if you can tell from this picture, a huge hand painted, uh, obviously made <laughs> of course by, by hand and so are the bowls and cups, um, made for you know, daily use or storage of goods at long, time, long term. These range from, I think it's 1100, so that's just under a thousand years old to 1300. And they're from the American Southwest and they're in the upstairs galleries. Yeah, there's another view of it, a little better lighting there. And these are some of the dolls. Now that is an actual stuffed buffalo or bison. The right word is bison actually. Nope, no nope, buffalo, it's, just, I, it's become acceptable now because that is the term used. The English translation, of course, is the term used by the Plains Indians. So these are uh, dolls made by Plains Indian tribe members on their one of their reservations, I believe, and donated to the museum uh, of, of the um, attire that Plains Indians would have worn. So you can go up a little closer. It's very detailed, not the faces so much as their, their clothing, though. And these are about, you know, somewhere between nine inches and a foot tall, each one of them. Uh, but the bubble's the real thing. <laughs> Looks like he's trying to butt his head against the wall to batter his way out of this. Uh, not one of the larger ones. I've seen buffaloes up close. Um, you may know you could see them at some of the national parks and don't get too close. I got a little too close with comfort ones. <laughs> um, it can be dangerous. Yeah, but they can get much, much, their, their uh, height at the shoulder can be as much as um, eight, well, not eight feet, but seven and a half feet, over seven feet. <clears throat> and these are the ones of the uh, Navajo uh, the Navajo have a preferred term. The woman who runs the museum, I interviewed her for my article, very interesting person. <clears throat> she calls herself Diné, and she's of Navajo heritage. She said that's a preferred term, D-I-N-E, with an accent on the E. <clears throat> so she's the one that took me through the museum, of course, and, and gave me descriptions of each of these. The baby here and the papoose. And the details on the blanket, they're just... Wonderful. <clears throat> now, this was a white woman, Marin County white woman, but she had studied these things and, and was making every uh, 
possible effort to make them accurate. And according to, you know, the woman who ran the museum, uh, they were accurate in every detail for the type of attire worn, say, 200 years ago or even more, you know, within the last several hundred years by the Navajo uh, in the southwestern United States. <clears throat> and then these are Inuit. Right, or used to be the old term is Eskimo that hardly anybody finds acceptable anymore, but you still hear it in some <coughs> media. <coughs> Excuse me, I can take a drink of water. Okay, so you probably can tell that's to a close up <coughs> that these are just mostly about their fur coats, and of course, this is a almost looks like a sleeping bag, we would call it, but of course that would be something that could be used either by, by young children or, or adults to uh, keep out the cold, okay? And then here's some more of the Navajo. These were made by actual Navajo tribe members uh, in this one's, one's creating, of course, some kind of a, a you know blanket probably on the quilting machine in the background. Now we're getting to the first of the must knows, and I believe I, the order is just slightly, it's only two, so it's not gonna cause any confusion, I would imagine, but here we go. It's down at the bottom of the week 13 list, the short list that we have tonight. And this is uh, the title, this is POMO, P-O-M-O, -O, Ceremonial Feather Regalia, that's R E. G A L I A. Pomo ceremonial feather regalia. This is in Novato. So the location is at the museum. It's a display upstairs on the second floor of the Museum of the American Indians. So we'll just give you the name of the town, of course, Novato. I think everyone knows how to spell Novato. And we don't know the exact date, but circa 1500. However, I found out by, you know, listening to the um, director of the museum that this is actually a replica of something that is at, stored in one of the Pomo lodges somewhere in the North Bay. The Pomo, I remember I said this earlier, but I don't know if anyone joined us this late, but just to briefly recap, that would be the name of the indigenous culture that occupied the Northern half of what some people call the Bay Area, it depends on your definition, Northern Sonoma County all the way through Mendocino County and over to Clear Lake. And they still are a hundred, well, thousands, probably thousands of them. I think there's been an accurate count of either the Pomo or uh, Miwa population, as in, you know, and of course it's it's harder to count them because they're scattered, uh, unlike in their heyday when before the arrival of Europeans, they had their own territories, their own villages. The Pomo in the northern half of that, they were very, very, uh, you know, let's just say enamored of using uh, feathers from eagles and other large birds of prey for their ceremonial dances and the this is like a cape is what it really is when we say regalia if you're curious what that is it wasn't just on display of course or you know maybe somehow uh attached to you know a, a structure or a wall or a pole uh, you know like a, you know, a banner or flag it was it was worn over the shoulders of a Pomo ceremonial dancer, usually those were elders in the tribe, but, but not always, they didn't have to be. But they were made by elders, at least this one was, recently, maybe you know, a few decades ago. So it's not brand new, but it's, it's not the age of when they would have made the actual original that this is a, a model or copy of full scale, full size. It almost would reach the ground. If this was for your, you know, on your head and this went around your shoulders, it would reach to your ankles, whoever the ceremonial dancers were. And they still do these dances. And in fact, a couple of, of the uh, craftsmen, that's the right term for them, that make these feather regalia for their own tribe have come down to this museum. And they will again, at some point, my, my guess is by hopefully early next year or summer when we get <laughs> where the pandemic is down to a dull roar, they'll reopen the museum fully. And then they'll have programs you can find on online, of course, if you're not in one of my classes, then it won't be for extra credit, but it'd be worth going to. I, I would certainly want to go to where they have these traditional ceremonial dances and they have the craftsmen who created these, uh, you know, replicas of the original. And they might even bring the several hundred year old originals, but they probably don't want to risk damaging them. So they probably will stay where they are currently kept 
uh, on their tribal lands. And in the meantime, you know, these would have been then in the early period before the Spanish arrived and even well into the Spanish era uh, before the numbers were decimated by everything from, of course, you know, being displaced to wars, of course, uh, violent conflicts and uh, disease, obviously. Uh, they, they would have continued well into the mid 19th century to do these ceremonies. And so every generation would have maybe a different, you know, craftsperson or a couple of them in each local, you know, tribe within the culture, the Boma culture, make their own set of feather regalia. Look how big these feathers are. Let's get up close to it. And we're going to do the formal analysis in just a moment. They're beautiful in every sense of the word. And these are found feathers. That's an important detail. Over, it could take them years, if not even a decade or more, to make one of these. It's really kind of a, 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 if I say cloak, that sounds like it goes all the way around, your, covers your entire body. It's more like a cape, but that's also kind of misleading because that seems to be more of a Western concept, right? So it's similar to a cape um, that you wear over your shoulder, but mostly would be visible uh, behind you as you danced in you know, ceremonial patterns. Okay, so these were taken. I, it's an important detail the director wants me to tell. I told her I was going to show these slides to these cla year classes uh, this semester. And she said, well, make sure they know we didn't go out and pluck a bunch of feathers off of live, captured or otherwise uh, inconvenienced, <laughs> or let alone, perhaps you could even say, you know, badly treated. They, they don't believe in that. Uh, animals, we, we would wait till they, you know, either passed away or the, the feathers naturally molted or dropped and they would find, could take, that's why it takes a long time to find uh, enough feathers to make one of these regalia capes. Okay, formal analysis. The color's mostly uh, cool, isn't it? Um, because it's grays and off whites, mostly gray. A little bit more warm on the headdress though, right? Or at least it looks like it in this view. Um, and then we have the obvious rhythm of the individual feathers uh, and for space, it's about a six foot tall. Well, yeah, including the headdress, of course, but without the headdress, it'd be about five feet from the top where the shoulder strap would be to the bottom is about five feet. And then the headdress is a good foot, a little more than a foot in length, but of course it's not gonna be applied to the back of the head here. It would be over the top of someone's head, the dancer's head. So they're two separate items. That means there's two masses. The, it's pretty obvious the largest mass is the cape, we'll call it the cape and the second largest is the uh, headdress. And when I said space, I forgot to mention there is overlapping, at least in this photo of it, if it were to be on the final. Uh, of course, the feathers overlap each other, but there's the real space. That's the more important uh, aspect of space here, which I just gave you the dimensions. Uh, it, it's dynamic. I don't see any straight lines anywhere in it. Each individual feather is curved and then, you know, the, the string on which it's wrapped, used to wrap around the shoulders and the headdress, it's, it's all dynamic. It's balanced. Amazingly so when you think about it, because it's not easy to create something like this with an equal number of feathers on either side, not to mention how long it takes you to gather them, but just when you start, uh, you know, uh, get, uh, you start applying them each, you know, and, and arranging them. Uh, so it's, I'd say very balanced, but you could just say roughly balanced if you want. Now, top to bottom, it matter, it depends, I mean, rather on, on how you see it. But I would say it's roughly balanced that way too. Uh, because if you drew the line here, the, the shoulder section or upper back covering portion of this cape and the headdress would roughly be about the same mass or area. I should say area because it's all oh is it two masses we already said that we covered that now is there no modeling not really it's the lighting from the museum is there a line here there's no drawn painted or carved line of course it's only uh the uh, color is of the feathers that create visual lines in fact let's get up close it's really interesting the edges actually the ridges is what they are on the feathers themselves so that creates visual line but there's no other kind of line here uh let's see i think that's it I think I covered everything, all the elements on this. Um, yeah, the rhythm is the repeated shapes of the feathers. Okay, here's another feather regalia. There were two there. Uh, and you see how similar, well, now that I think about it, I think this is another one where the lighting was different, the same. Let's just double check. Yeah, because it's been 
like six months since I was there. Yeah, it's just the same one with a different light. Okay, now we're going to do the second must know, but we're going to not uh, finish immediately. But what I'll do is do the few more slides we have and then stop and, and uh, try to remember at least one more. I think I should easily be able to do that one more uh, film about the life of an artist that you might want to consider uh, watching. Yes, I remember what the, f the fifth one is. About Michelangelo. I'll do that at the end after the slides are done. Okay, so this is a must know. Uh, of the two views, you see, I have more than one view because these are my own slides that I took of each of these sites and each of these objects. I think the closer up view is the better one. Yeah, so if it's on the exam, yeah, because you, you get more of a focus on the structure and not the trees around it. So here we go. The title of this, and it is a must know, so you should take notes. Miwok, and I remember that's M-I-W-O-K, round house, and in parentheses, their own word for a house was kocha. Uh, very interesting. You know, it sounds almost like Eastern European uh, terms that I've heard, but it's their own indigenous language word for a home. K-O-T-C-H-A. So again, it'll be open book test, of course. So you shouldn't have any problem spelling these words correctly um, the way they are on the syllabus. I'll say the title again, Miwok Roundhouse, and then a parenthesis, but if you don't want to use a parenthesis, you can just comma, Kocha, K-O-T-C-H-A, the title. Location, again, Novato, and the date this was modeled after, a patent after is 500 AD or CE. Okay, so what do we know about uh, how they constructed these homes? Uh, well, this is made out of tule, which is, it's, it's almost like a kind of a, uh, it's a plant. Of course, it grows in, in um, tidal waters, which are all around the Bay Area. So obviously it was plentiful. That's how they made, we already said, how they made their canoes and some of their uh, duck and, uh, uh, you know, hunting lures uh, and also their houses. So they use obviously things from their natural environment. The word green or phrase it's two words so i guess it's not a word green architecture well they had it thousands of years ago the idea of making things quote environmentally integrated or you know, the other way some people prefer to say environmentally friendly it's part of the meaning now this was the first culture in on the west coast one of not not the first but one of the first of the many indigenous cultures uh, to literally live by that concept or by what that. was the material again Tule, T-U-L-E, you know, which grows along the shores of, uh, well, creeks, it could be even ponds and things, but also along the edges of the bay, or at least it used to in, in huge quantities. So it can be dried out and it is weather uh, resistant to cold and uh, can be made waterproof. But in case it's not obvious, what they did was stack rows of these, right? Uh, with, you know, on top of each other and then bind them together. With, they didn't have rope per se, but they had, you know, this kind of a binding uh, branches that they used to bind, and twigs, of course, to, to bind the uh, rows of tule plants, dried tule plants together. And this would be big enough. It's bigger than it might look. I mean, I, it was just, and most people weren't even six feet then. So, so an adult male could walk through this opening. I mean, when I looked at it, I didn't want to go inside because, yeah, I, didn't think it was appropriate, but the museum director said, you know, you're taller than most of the Miwoks and most adults now are uh, fully grown uh, male adults would be too tall. But that, that was about the height of a, an average or just above, I should say, the height of an average uh, adult male in the Miwok culture and plenty of height for children and most of the women who of course were shorter. And so this could, could house a whole family, an extended family, as many as a dozen people easily through a winter. And then of course, they, they use them in the summer as well because they were cooler than the take. It, it was very hot when I was there, like it was June or July and it was already 90 some degrees. Uh, this is, like I said, on the grounds of the Museum of the American Indian, which is in the city of Novato, not near the old downtown. It's about a five mile drive from there, but it's in the city limits. And uh, there's also the other kind of Miwok house you'll see, but this is the only one that's the must know for, for tonight's lecture. So let's talk about one other thing about these houses. Uh, they weren't portable 
but in a way they were. They're, they're not teepees or like teepees in that regard, but they could be made fairly quickly because it was so easy to gather these tule, uh, I'll say branches. I mean, that makes it sound like it comes from a tree, I guess. Uh, tule logs, but then that's also mis misleading. So just say tule, dried tule uh, plants. There we go, plants. Because they were so plentiful, they didn't really feel the need to try and move when, you know, either there was a problem with their crops or, you know, flooding, right? Uh, or, or really bad, uh, you know, uh, famine maybe from rainfall or you know the danger of the famine they they would move if they had to but it was so easy to, to just rebuild these wherever they moved within the greater barrier area, their tribal areas which you know was several hundred square miles of course so they rarely moved them but they could have if they wanted to they could have i mean they're not so they're not obviously anchored down there's no foundation so they could become portable in an emergency if needed but they weren't mostly they were meant to just be where they were built and that's it. And once they finally had the worn out their useful life, they would just make a new one nearby or move if they chose to. Okay, so that's pretty much the whole meaning. Again, the word kocha is, it means house. It doesn't mean roundhouse. That's a general term for any type of, of housing that they had. And this is one of the two main kinds. You'll see the other kind in just a couple minutes. So let's do the formal analysis. Well, here the color, to me, it's cool because it has a kind of a gray look, doesn't it? Or off-white even. I would call it uh, a cool color. The texture is the real texture. Oh, I forgot to say that about the, ah, my apologies. That's what I forgot. The texture here is smooth, real texture. There's no simulated texture. That was the important element, of course, with a feather cape like this. Okay, but the texture here is rough, real uh, tule plant. There's no cement texture, obviously. And the only kind of modeling is the shadow inside formed by the, you know, from the absence of the sun. In other words, natural shadows from inside. There's no technique for modeling, of course. It's, it's basically symmetrical. I know here it looks like this one is longer, but most of them were made maybe even you know, this one might have missed a few possibly. It's been, these were vandalized. If you can believe that, some jerks went here and vandalized these. So they they still have to do a little more repair. Ay, ay, ay. Anyway, so they're, you know, pretty accurate reproductions down to, well, we know, why do we know that? Because of both painters and engravers, there were no photographers as far back in the mid 1800s after the missions had been, well, even almost before, the, just before they were taken over by the gold rush invasion of, the Yankees from, you know, all around the world, but mostly from the eastern United States during the gold rush. So there were already, in other words, in the early 1800s, there were painters uh, accompanying the Spanish missionaries sometimes uh, to go and, you know, document, uh, illustrate, paint, or, or, you know, depict, however you want to say that, the uh, the villages of the Miwok and other, other indigenous cultures all, all over California, not just in the North Bay. And so we have some images. We know wh what their houses look like. So it would have been symmetrical when it was brand new. Uh, it's a single mass. For space, it's real space. It's a, a large open round space with about a 10 foot high ceiling inside. And it's a part of the space is the capacity. It can hold up to a dozen people. So it's all real space. I mean, I can't really say there's overlapping. I guess you could stretch and say, well, these these branches overlap the tules, but that's really getting too picky. Okay, then we have um, balance. Yeah, I think I said that already. Um, rhythm, yes. The rhythm would be all of the different. These are branches here, by the way, that tie, that tie uh, the tule plants together. Uh, so that, those branches and the tule plants themselves create rhythm, of course. And the two sides of the entryway, if you want to call it that. Um, Let's see, line is visual line here on this. Absolutely, there, there is no drawn, painted, or carved line. It's just the lines that are formed between each of the brand, uh, sorry, the tulip plants and by the branches. And is it stable or dynamic? It's dynamic. I, I don't really see, unless you want to, again, you could stretch the, the point, I suppose, if it's on the exam and say, well, each of these branches that help tie the tulip together are mostly horizontal, except that they curve all the way around. So to me, the whole thing is, 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 is dynamic. 
and I wouldn't say any any part of it is a straight line, even the branches. So it's entirely dynamic as I see it. Okay, so let's just do a few more slides and then I will finish up with a couple more uh, options for extra credit and then take any questions that you have. And as you can see, we're gonna end uh, in about 10 or 15 minutes. So that will be way earlier than usual and you guys have the rest of the evening free. Okay, this is a grain storage that was made with uh, branches from um, elm trees. They could make them from any kind of branches, but these are branches from elm trees that were used to store grain during, of course, the winter months. Right outside, and it is right next to, you know, if I had more room, I think there was a wall behind me. Um, they could step back and you'd see it's right over here, right where my, the arrow is, in fact. Um, and of course, each family would have to have make, construct, and then maintain their own grain storage. You could say unit if you want. This isn't a must know, so you don't have to write any details about the design or materials or anything like that, texture or anything, but but just, you know, as context, just giving you the background here. So the, this is bigger than it looks. Um, I think I was up, so it's about seven feet to the top here, yeah. Uh, and they, they could store enough grain for a whole family or extended, you know, 12 people is usually at least two generations living in each of the coaches. Uh, and then that would, you know, get them through the winter or at least until, you know, a break in the weather in, you know, February when we often have an early spring, as you all know, right? Some of the plants start blooming and they could come out and, and do some more hunting and gathering or, and then of course not yet plant, that'd be too early. So they could have enough grain to get through just say several weeks in the winter each year, each family. And it was up to each elder or, you know, tribal leader or family, I meant fam, clan, there we go, clan within the tribe, the fam, family subgroups or clans. Uh, they, they would designate who it was that had to do the hunting, of course, as well as maintain and or build these structures, this grain storage bin, if you want to call it that, and their houses, as well as stock them. Okay, so this is the other kind of Miwok kocha. And it's not on the must. I was going to make both on there, but I thought it could get confusing, so I kept it simple. This looks like a teepee to a lot of people, and that's what I thought of when I first saw it. It definitely is the same shape as a teepee, uh, but it's very different because this is made out of uh, redwood bark. And if I recall, I have no. This is the closest one. Let's get. Let's do a close-up view. This is really interesting to me that these are the redwood trees. Of course, indigenous as they are to you know, Northern California, particularly along, you know, just near the coastline, right? Where the Miwok were in their whole, you know, tribal area. Um, these couldn't hold more than one family. And the opening's a bit narrow, but that also could control who came and went. And so you would have more control over who you allowed in, who you invited, who would, you, would be your guests for a meal or visit, or even maybe spend the night. But it's bigger than it looks inside. I remember I just poked my head in and I thought, hmm, I could see about eight people, maybe not probably 12, but probably eight people. Well, that'd be pretty much the full family size, right? And maybe one or two, either a grandparent or somebody else in the family, but it wouldn't be big enough for a full you know, extended family. So the smaller of the two size uh, types, I mean, the house was this size was, uh, I still call it kocha, and there isn't really any other term for it, but I would call it the TP style if you had to label it. But of course, you don't have to write about it. It's not on the syllabus. And of course, it's totally, again, the architecture is environmentally integrated. You can't get more green than this. It's made from the bark of redwoods. It grew all around them, of course, or in many parts of the Bay Area. Because you know, they were in the area where Muir Woods is now. That was their territory. So it'd be easy to find plenty of bark for these. And whole villages were made out of these redwood bark coaches. Uh, yeah, I did have a closer view now I remember. Uh, and some of them got pretty, pretty tall, like, you know, 11, 10, 11 feet, the, the peak of them. But most of them were only, the biggest ones you're gonna see are at a state park called Olampali. And we'll end with that, just a few more slides to show you now. 
Uh, and that's another extra credit option you could go. I'll tell you when we get to those slides. But this is still on the grounds of the Museum of the American Indian, by the way, just outside the entrance, which again, if it's closed, you could still go there and get extra credit for taking four different photos of uh, these structures or more if you want and sending them to me in a PDF, right? It's worth 10 points for it because it is architecture. Obviously this is architecture. Now this could be portable pretty easily. Uh, but as far as I know, they didn't feel the need very often unless there was an emergency, of course, like the kind of climate emergencies or weather emergencies that I just described. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, it was much more practical to possibly move this and was, therefore probably more often. Infrequently, though, it would have been, uh, it, it was much easier to move these. Here's the other, this is the uh, Miwok village, they call it, well, it's hardly a village. This is the area uh, known in Novato. It's on the very outskirts, right? Almost at the county line between Marin and Sonoma County, but it's still Marin County here. And uh, this is Olompali State Park. I'll spell for you if you're curious to know more about it for extra credit or go see it. Uh, Olompali, O-L-O. Uh, o -l -o -m -p -a -l -i, O-L-O-M-P-A-L-I, State Park, it's a state park, and these are replicas of the uh, teepee style coaches, which could hold more people here, because see, if you remove this board, that's a perfectly wide enough entrance for, you know, a mother and children or two kids or even, you know, maybe a couple to go inside, and then uh, this is, you know, reconstructed as I, I said, but this is how they would have lived, say, around a thousand to fifteen hundred years ago. Here on the site of Olam Poly State Park or several other historic structures, they're described in my article. I don't have slides of them, and I wasn't going to, you know, go off on a tangent here for your purposes. We're just sticking to the Miwok uh, related sites in the North Bay. Uh, but it would be worth a visit because that park is open, but the buildings on the grounds, well, they're not, but you don't need to, you know, have, you know, a ticket or someone admits you to the, you know, so you wouldn't, of course, want to go inside these. That wouldn't be appropriate. Um, but this one here, for instance, is, is big enough to hold, I would say, at least eight to 10 people, bigger than the ones on the grounds of the Novato Museum. Uh, and again, at least potentially easily portable. The point is this was the largest, they think, this site where the park is, the whole park was part of a larger village that had somewhere in the range of anywhere from 1500, the range I've read historians think is at the low end. So it's probably much more, more like say 2000 to 5000 people. That's a good sized community, especially for this far back uh, in an agrarian, right? Agricultural based. Uh, culture and, uh, of course, with the resources available, they made villages that, uh, you know, were in the thousands, the low thousands, and that's, it was a good sized community even in other parts of the world that far back, because they used the same uh, style of construction for both their roundhouse and these teepee-like ones all through their uh, recorded history. And it is recorded. It's recorded in a different way, not in written records, of course. It's oral history, which they have maintained. And there's all kinds of evidence of uh, some of the uh, survive, you know, you can say survivors, the descendants, a better word, descendants of their culture uh, being uh, interviewed for documentation on the earlier history of where they lived, where their largest village. That's how we know this is one of the, probably the largest Miwok village is from their elders uh, or, or their, you know, tribal, uh, you know, members who chose to do that task to keep an oral history maintained verbally. There's a precedent for that in Western culture. It's called Fahrenheit 451. There's a great book for you, though I wouldn't quite give you extra credit because it's a little far afield. Ray Bradbury's story was made into at least two different film versions. He's great. Yeah, it's a wonderful movie, but it's also depressing <laughs> because there's some parts of it that are starting to come through. And it was written about as early as uh, 1984. And it's in that vein, a dystopian future. And it's beautifully uh, written, that novel, Fahrenheit 451. And it's, and it's about them having all the books being burned and taken away decades before the movie set. And the only way to preserve them is orally. Each person memorizes one entire book and then they repeat them to each other. It's, it's well, anyway, you have to see the movie. So it's not, you know, only the early indigenous cultures that did that or the aboriginal cultures in Australia, which still do, of course, 
or Inuit cultures would still do up in the north regions. But many cultures still do that, even, even within, quote, urban, right, developed countries. Okay, so this isn't a must know, so we'll just go. You can see the setting, it's just beautiful. Yeah, this is a close up of one of the larger, I don't even know that this would be just a, you know, a single person or couple's home before they had a family. I'm not sure why that went so much smaller than the other two. There was no text here. I, I went here when there was no way. The rangers aren't on duty, but that you can go to, through the park without it. Well, at least I wasn't stopped or asked for ID or they'd ask you to pay dollars for the parking. Normally in, in a state park, that's normal. Cash only, by the way. But, uh, well, no, there it was check or cash. But I don't think they're enforcing that. But if they are, you would want to bring with you cash to do that because you don't want to take it <laughs> from the U.S. Park Service is probably expensive. Okay, and here's an, the, the third one that's uh, much less well-maintained and, of course, needs a little repair. I mean, even as an exhibit or a replica. But it's of the same redwood bark that we've seen all the other ones. Local indigenous material, natural to the environment, environmentally friendly. There we go. It's a little closer view of it. I don't know if people take picnics here. I guess they do. The picnic tables are for. And then this is uh, a different view of the uh, middle-sized one. And then that's the largest one we saw, the first one, from a different angle. And then I try to get all three in one picture. I guess I kind of did. But look at the, the, the material. It's just, you know, these, these are decades old. These replicas are decades old. This park has been open at least 50 years, maybe more. And I know I go by it all the time, you know, drive up 101, right? It's right off of 101. Uh, just after you get past Novato, north of Novato, and just before the uh, county line or in Sonoma County line, uh, you'll see a sign and the exit is well marked. But again, if you want more detailed directions, you can look it up online, the park, uh, Olapali State Parks, you know, uh, web page or, or read my article and, and there's a link in there. I think they put it in the online version, the Marine Magazine editor, I asked them to do that. You know, if you're going kind of thing at the end of articles often, there should be something like that. Definitely the address is for both the museum in my article, uh, in Novato, the town proper, the Museum of American Indian and this state park, the addresses are in my article. Uh, yeah, that's a nicer view. It was a nice time of day to go. Now, the last thing I'll show you, now you're gonna say, what, it's a rock. Well, it's more than that. This is how they made those grains into meal, cereal, uh, paste, uh, condiments. Yes, they had their own kind of condiments or, or otherwise prepared any kind of agricultural uh, you know, products for meals, for large. We're talking about, like I said, a minimum of 1,500 people. It's a large area, probably three to 5,000 is more likely that lived in this one village. And this rock is from about that far back and it was carved. It's a volcanic rock, which was carved to be useful for different people all at the same time would gather around this rock to, you know, maybe for their own clan, their extended family. It could be, you know, maybe they lived in three or four closely arranged coches in one area and then they'd send whoever it was assigned to do the, you know, food preparation down to this. It's called the grinding rock, or at least that's the nickname for it. And it's uh, on the grounds of the Olam Pali State Park. And uh, we know the rock is millions of years old, or at least hundreds of thousands from whenever the last volcanic eruptions happened in the North Bay. Uh, <clears throat> it's been a while, right? But uh, it, it, it was carved like this uh, about, um, yeah, about 1500 years ago, around 500 AD. And it was used for centuries, uh, well over a thousand years until the mid to eight, late 1800s. Also the oldest authentic, uh, the remnants of about half of the walls of the oldest adobe, which was actually built by and for the last um, you know, chief of the Miwok tribe in that area where the park is. That's inside one of the exhibit buildings. Now that building was closed when I was there and it probably still is. But there's a picture of it, a nice photo of it uh, that I got from the Park Service and, and it's pretty impressive. It's from about 1830s. That's almost 200 years old. And it's still a Miwok related uh, historic uh, artifact because it was built by a Miwok tribal elder as the last person to independently rule over this land before the Spanish and then the gold rush <laughs> uh, invaders took, took it over. 
And so that's, you know, about as late as the indigenous culture was still able to function independently, about 1830s before they lost everything. Okay, so let me see. I think that might be the last image. Oh, this is a different view of it. Oh, yeah, I forgot I had a couple of angles. Yeah, for the, I took these off in this article. Okay, so I'm going to now stop the share and tell you the fifth film I was trying to remember. And it's a good one, but it, it, it has one caveat. It's called uh, The Agony and the Ecstasy. Few of you may have heard of it. It's, it won several Academy Awards. It was made in 1964 on the 400th anniversary of Michelangelo's death. It's about, it's a true story about his experience creating the Sistine Chapel ceiling. And it has Rex Harrison who won, I can't remember, I don't think, Charlton Heston of all things. Do you, you know, he did just run around in a, you know, loincloth yelling apes everywhere, right? Planet of the Apes, that, he did all right, that movie actually. <laughs> He's a pretty good actor when he put his mind to it. He, he did a good job as Michelangelo, quite believable. But the best portrayal that won the Academy Award for supporting actor was Rex Harrison, who was in My Fair Lady, my British actor, of course, who played the Pope, Pope Julius, who forced him to, to, to paint the ceiling. And it's a very accurate portrayal of what Michelangelo's experience was that entire four years what he had to go through, how he resisted it, how the Pope forced him back at the point of his sword with his soldiers arresting him and dragging him back in chains to, uh, to uh, Rome. Um, based on the novel by the same name and that novel, see, when I say novel, you think, oh, this must be a lot of it is fictionalized. No, it's, it's a novelized history. The author of that one, The Agony and Ecstasy, that it, the movie's based on, is also the author of Lust for Life. He did a lot of those kinds of things. Irving Stone, a, he was a great writer. Um, his, his books were always bestsellers and, and he did his research. And so his books actually have, you know, glossaries and, and you know, I don't think footnotes, I can't remember, I haven't read one in a while. But they're, they're about 90% accurate. But the one thing in that film version, again, the 1964, I think it was released in 65, but it was made, that isn't accurate is they have a, a female character who, yes, he did know an upper, uh, well, upper class, nothing, a noble woman, a high ranking noble woman who was someone who supported his career and, and he wrote to it in case he visited, but they imply they had a romantic relationship. There's plenty of evidence that he could easily have been gay, but we don't know that for sure. All we know is there's no proof of any intimate relationship in his life beyond uh, close friendships. Uh, but you know, there's a good chance he was, you know, bisexual, but someday we'll get a letter or something that'll prove one way or the other. But the, the, almost certainly he wasn't involved in a heterosexual intimate relationship and certainly not with that woman. So that's the one thing in the whole movie you have to dismiss, but it was made in the mid sixties, remember? Other than that, it's a very accurate portrayal. And I think the best things about it, besides showing you the ceiling, they had to actually recreate a, a set just as large and as tall as the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel to make this movie. They weren't allowed to do it on site. That would be, the Pope would never allow that. So they recreated the setting accurately and the, the process of, of, of creating the, the frescoes. But they also did a good job at the beginning. It's about a 15 minute intro. Maybe it's more like 12. That's worth almost watching the whole film about his uh, sculpture. And that's what he was best known for during his lifetime. He didn't think he was a very good painter. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's a brilliant little, it's almost like a mini documentary at the front of the film. Anyway, the film is called um, The Agony and Ecstasy. And that'd be my fifth candidate for among many great films, five of the best films made about the lives of an artist or life of an artist. Okay, anybody have a... Um, a question that you would like to ask about, uh, you know, either your second papers. I, I've already said I'm not going to hold up again, but if you did miss the beginning, you can go, you know, replay on uh, YouTube uh, the first few minutes where I gave specific. But I will say, remember the papers, of course, they're due. I have a question. Sure. Two weeks from tonight, and they have to be submitted the same way they were as a PDF as the first paper. I, I, I think I got it narrowed down to what I'm doing, but one thing I was thinking about doing was a sculpture, but it, 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 the artist is unknown. And I'm not sure what you would do in that situation if you would just talk about the sculpture of that era and that region. What period is it? 
And what style can you? Discuss? I mean, I'm probably going to go with the painting because I, I can answer questions about that. But it was. No, uh, I wouldn't want to dissuade you if you're more interested in the sculpt. It, what was it called? It was the flying horse of Gansu or something. It was a. It's a. It's yeah. It's Chinese. It's a horse running on top of a dove or something like that or a sparrow. Okay, well, I can answer that question. It could be relevant for anybody thinking of doing a piece where they don't know who the artist was. In most ancient pieces, we don't, right? So you would then just focus on the historical context of the period of the culture, you know, what was going on in that culture when it was created, and if you can, about the technique or style you used. Okay. As well as, of course, a very thorough formal analysis. But remember, the only caveat I have about that for pieces that aren't as well documented as, as some of the more famous ones is the research sources you need. That's kind of tough. <laughs> yeah, if you can't easily find or reasonably quickly find yeah. three new sources, including one that was originally a print source, I would then pick another one. Yeah, I think I'm going for my painting, but it dawned on me because I actually have a replica of it that I got. Hmm. after a visit to the de Young when well, I was very young. If you want to do this, you can uh, submit a picture of it with a little description, you know, more than a couple sentences, you know, right? what, a page or something, or a couple paragraphs, and you could get five points extra credit. All right, I think cool. I said that if you want to submit your own original artwork, yeah, I think I did it at the beginning of the semester. If I didn't, I'm repeating, I'm or stating right. it now. If you created your own artwork, now how am I going to know? It's called the honor system. <laughs> uh, yeah, then then you, but you need to give me more than one image. Just shooting me one image of one painting, four or more at a time with your name and the title or at least one line about each work. That's it, one line's enough. Is it what the meaning or the intent was? Or if you gave it a title, because a lot of artists just say untitled, but maybe you know something about the meaning and in a sentence would be good. For each of say four or more, well, four is enough color images in one PDF, that would be worth five points. And you can do that, well, maybe what four times would be up to 20 points. I do want to keep it to 20 points uh, uh, as a maximum in each category, if you could, for all extra credit, uh, you know, the different options you, you know, they are. But anyway, that's one I almost forgot to mention because I don't think it, it's not on that handout I sent you guys at the beginning of the semester. But it only applies to people that have their own artwork documented online already. and want to write a little short thing about four pieces or more. Okay, any other questions about uh, pay, the second paper or extra credit? I got a quick question about sure. extra credit. Um, I recently visited the MoMA and I wanted to uh, show proof I went. Should I send that to your .edu email or your AOL email? AOL is faster. I know people go, huh? What, AOL? That's so old school. Okay, fine. <laughs> That's true. So wasn't it the first website? No, anyway, but I can tell you, navigating it is much easier, at least for that kind of item. Retrieving, you know, and opening and 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 down, you know, logging in the uh, extra credit or papers or exams or any any other, uh, you know, uh, credit worthy work or submission. I should say submissions by by students. I found that to be the case. Why I prefer you to submit everything to Mark W. D. O. L. If you want to be really extra thorough, you could do both. I mean, whoops, sorry. You you could uh, you know you know back it up with one because I will see it eventually. I check at least three times a week and more often four, depending on what else is happening and if there's a holidays or whatever. But uh, of the 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 outlook of this, right? Okay. But I check my AOL more frequently than that, at least five times a week, five or six times a week. So you'll, you'll get a more faster response from that. And it'll be easier for me to log it in. But, Sounds good. Thank you. but preferred, it may, you should probably just send it to, if you're only going to send it to one, you should send it to the Mark W at AOL. Okay. Okay. So let's see. Any other questions um, about extra credit or your second papers or the material we just covered tonight? Remember, if you join a few people, I know. Uh, I understand people get it. I used to prefer seven to 10, but I know a lot of people say that I can't hang out till 10 o'clock. When I taught in person, that was a standard, uh, but it gave people more time to get to the class because they had to get there physically uh, or even log in. Um, but now the standard is 6.30. So some people can't join right at 6.30. I understand that. So you can just watch what you missed, of course, about the specifics, but I can, again, last point, one more time, summarize that the requirements of the second paper are exactly the same as the first paper. And you'll get a cover sheet, 
a few days before it's due, that'll say paper, short paper number two, which needs to be attached if possible in the same file, PDF file, and submitted to my AOL. Okay, uh, let's see, one more time. Anybody have any other questions relating to tonight's topics uh, or to extra credit or your second papers? Uh, what date will the second paper be due by? Oh, well, yeah, that's what I was saying earlier. It's due two weeks from tonight. I give you till midnight. Uh, so like on the 22nd or? Uh-huh. Yes, oh, okay. 22nd of November. Right. All right. Thank you. Yeah. It's on your syllabus too. Okay. Any other questions? Well, we're ending when we usually start taking a break. So you guys get the whole second half. We're not quite. But anyway, more than an hour of, well. We all, we all got to go watch art movies. <laughs> watch what kind of movie? Art, art movies. Yeah, art. Oh, okay. Good. <laughs> Well, you have some choices that you can all find on your own, but those five, I doubt anyone who has a genuine interest in art, and I know most of you do already before you took this class, would find any of them boring. But yeah, I think the Agony Essay is two and a half hours. It's the longest. Most of them are around two hours. The requirement is a minimum of one hour, either a feature film or documentary, which you write two full page about, because I know a couple people joined us after I get, started giving that list when I did the first four and then just finished with the fifth one. Um, so just keep that in mind that you, you do need to write two pages about the movie and there's no you know points for you know grammar or spelling or points off or anything. It's just what you, you, you felt about, you learned, I meant to say that you learned about that artist's work and life from that documentary or that film. It's pretty straightforward. I think it's, it's a new option I created just last semester and it, seem to be pretty popular with people. So you have until the end of final exams week for all the extra credit options, okay? One more time before we sign off. Anybody else have any urgent question? Of course, I'll be checking my email through the week on and off if you have follow-up questions or samples of the paper you want me to look at. Of course, don't wait till the night before it's due, but then I'm gonna see you one more time before the week that it's due, a week from tonight. Uh, if you want me to give you feedback, you need to say, this is a draft or rough draft. Please give me some feedback. So I'll know you're not just submitting it early. That is an important detail because if I get something a day or two before it's due and you don't say that, I'll say, oh, it's just an early submission and that's it. I'll just lock it in. So if you need my feedback, you should state that just to make sure you cover all the bases. And I'll know to respond to it uh, usually within 24 hours to 48 at the most after you send it. Okay, one more time, anybody? All right. Uh, hopefully you guys have a good week and I'll see you all next Monday and good luck with your papers. Okay. Good night. <laughs> Take care. Go watch our movie. <laughs>